Fresno State to the Big 12, that one I'm just not buying. I'm not buying for a second. I'm Pete Mundo on HeartlandCollegeSports.com covering the Big 12. It is great to be here with you as we um, look at this story here that came down in the last few days. So this came down in the middle of the Elite Eight Sweet 16 weekend. So it was one of those things that didn't get a lot of attention. But now that the Big 12 basketball season is over, uh, let's dive into this, and we'll get to the basketball season coming up here in a few minutes on the show. So this came down from uh, the president at Fresno State. Yes, uh, the president of Fresno State made a comment according to the San Joaquin Valley Sun. The president at Fresno State uh, made the comment that the Big 12, the Big 12, yes, and let me make sure I have this Verbatim out of the article. The president confirmed the rumors that the Big 12 is interested in Fresno State, saying the major conference would like to add a strong West Coast brand to its ranks. Now, does that make any sense to you? Like, just, just let's just use some common sense together here for a second. Does Fresno State make any sense to you to the Big 12? What, Derek Carr? Who's the most notable Fresno State NFL player? I, can you think of that person off the top of your head? Derek Carr is the only guy that comes to mind for me. Oh, I know some of you are going to point out Devontae Adams. Okay. All right, I'll give you Devontae Adams. That's fine. I'll give you him. Who else is there? Who else is that person? All right, that's one. Two, basketball. What's going on there? Explain to me why Fresno State makes any sense. From that perspective, it doesn't. If you want to go to California and you want to go into a lower tiered conference, wouldn't you maybe go to the team that's going to a Final Four right now? Knock on the front door of San Diego State and say, hey, Final Four, a great chance. We want to be in California. Welcome to the Big 12. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? If you're going to look to California to plant your flag right now, if you're Brett Yormark. So why would all this be happening? What would the motivator be for all this? Well, the motivator is something called Measure E. Measure E is back. And what it basically is, is a way and something the taxpayers have to vote on to deliver hundreds of millions of dollars to Fresno State. It came up short in a vote last year. And uh, this past week, there was a chance and an attempt to revive Measure E. So... Uh, Last November, Fresno County voters opted against Measure E, 47 to 53, so a razor-thin margin. They needed a simple majority to get this thing enacted. It did not pass. It would have increased sales taxes and things like that. It would have brought in hundreds of millions of dollars for Fresno State. What would they have done? $160 million to modernize Valley Children's Stadium. Uh, $80 million in maintenance, $45 million for a concert hall, affordable housing, endowments, modernizing the Duncan Athletic Center. So that's what this money would go to. So now they're trying to get this thing passed again. So if you want to get this thing passed again in your Fresno State, right, and you're like, all right, what do we need to do to get this thing over the hump? What, what do we have to do to get this thing over the hump? Well... Let's say the Big 12 is interested, and the best way for us to try to get into the Big 12 is to, well, spend all this money, spend hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer monies on improving our stadiums, um, improving our athletic centers, building a concert hall, maintenance, endowments. That's what we have to do if the Big 12 is going to be serious about this. But now that we add this all together and we actually have a story here, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not something that as you look at this from the standpoint of, you know, being a Big 12 fan and the Big 12, it certainly doesn't make sense. And then you look at the flip side and you're like, OK, why would Fresno State be motivated to throw this tidbit out there? Well, they're desperate to get this funding. And considering it's got to go to a vote of the people and they only lost by a couple of points, they're thinking to themselves, OK, how do we tug on people's emotions here? Well, don't you want to be a Big 12 school? Don't you want to be considered by a Power 5 conference? Well, if you want to be considered by a Power 5 conference, by golly, you've got to get all in on this. You've got to get on board with this. And I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, nah, 
Now, I don't think the taxpayers in Fresno County are going to fall for this because there has not been a single report of the Big 12 being interested in Fresno State and nothing I've heard about the Big 12 being interested in Fresno State to suggest that uh, this makes any sense whatsoever for anybody involved. But if you are a school president and you want to do a little wink, wink, nod, nod to try to get your bill passed, that's what you would do. It would make sense if you're the president at Fresno State, Saul Jimenez Sandoval. They'd say, hey, the Big 12 wants us. You better jump on board. So when I see this story of the Fresno State president saying, yeah, yeah, I'd love to be, uh, you know, get all this money, hundreds of millions of dollars for our university because, you know, the Big 12 wants us, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I, if I were you as a Big 12 fan or a college football fan or even a Fresno State fan, if you're being honest with yourself, there's no reason to buy this. It's very clear what's going on here. The Fresno State president is trying to get this thing passed. He's trying to get hundreds of millions of dollars out of the taxpayer's back pocket through Measure E. And if they can throw this tidbit out there and then leak it to the media of, hey, the Big 12 interested in us. The Big 12, yeah, oh, yeah, the big, bad, big, you saw them, right? I mean, you know, seven teams in the NCAA tournament, played in the college football playoff championship game. Uh, they're interested in Fresno State. And then it's like, when it doesn't happen, how are you going to prove that he was wrong when he said they weren't interested? There's not a lot to do on that front. So I'm just sitting here, I'm looking at this, and I'm sitting back and I'm saying, I don't buy it for a second that the Big 12 is actually interested in Fresno State. And if I was you, I wouldn't either. Now, uh, speaking of conference news and conference realignment talk, Dan Wetzel wrote this piece for Yahoo Sports. Yeah, Dan Wetzel still writing uh, stuff. How about that? Here's what he wrote. The grass is not always greener. Why the remaining Pac-12 schools should stick together. He writes, Brett Yormark is good. There's no denying that. In less than eight months on the job, he's taken the league best known for its defensiveness and turned it into an aggressor and an agitator. He goes on the, you know, give your mark credit, talks about the Rucker Park deal, and then he goes on to say, quote, the buzz of speculation around the Pac-12 has been enough for Robbins, the Arizona president, and other Pac-12 presidents and ADs to address the league's solidarity as its television negotiations drag on without Bell Cows, USC, and UCLA. He said that mostly are centered on the so-called corner schools, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah, that your mark and his crew have made clear they desire to form a revamped, nearly coast-to-coast 16-team Big 12. And then he adds, no matter the denials, which in college sports history mean nothing, there has to be some desire to consider the innovated or simply loud league based in Texas. Let me stop right there. Yes, the Big 12 has been loud. Yes, the Big 12 has been very effective the last few months. But I love how these national guys are so butthurt by the Big 12, like actually standing up for itself for once. Whether it's uh, Wetzel or uh, who is the guy with the athletic whose name I try to black out, Mandel, any of these guys. Forget the actual West Coast uh, local guys, regional guys out there. It's like the Big 12 has been raided for the better part of 15 years. The Big 12 has almost died multiple times. The Big 12 finally has people in charge who are going to stand up for the league, who are going to push back on the nonsense and try to be an aggressor instead of just getting chewed up for the last 15 years. And now it's so offensive to some of these national writers because it triggers, it triggers what they believe the hierarchy in college athletics to be and what they want it to be. And that's SEC Big Ten, and then, oh, well, they like the ACC, too, because of, you know, basketball and Duke and North Carolina. And, well, by golly, the Pac-12, I mean, a lot of them are based on the West Coast, L.A. They like the Pac-12. They have an affinity for the Pac-12. And, oh, you know, the Big 12, that's just kind of the Rubes and the Heartland and the Plains. You know, it's just, you know, they kind of, they, they almost die, then they come back. But, you know, I mean... They have never liked the idea of the Big 12 doing what it has done the last eight months under Brett Yormark. And I think it really offends them and it really bothers them that they always perceived Yormark as one of them. And by that, I mean a guy who's from New York, who's from one of the coasts, who was kind of, you know, maybe in their 
sphere, their lexicon. And now here he is, you know, rebranding himself, rebranding the Big 12, yes, out of Dallas, but building this thing from coast to coast and given two double middle fingers along the way in a polite way. I, you know, he's not, he's not being a jerk about it. He's just kicking butt and taking names is what he's doing. And I think that it has upset the apple cart of hierarchy in college athletics, and the old guard is really bothered by it. I mean, the way that Dan Wetzel writes about the Big 12, I imagine him writing that or any of these guys writing that about any other major conference in America. Well, you know, they have a desire to be innovative, but maybe they're really just loud. League based in Texas. Like, is there something wrong with any of that? Would you write that ever about the SEC? It's plenty of noise that's been coming out of the SEC for the better part of, you know, 15 years. Some good, some bad. Probably wouldn't write that. But then he goes on to say here, Dan Wetzel, Yahoo, goes on the note here in this article. He says, even if it's less money, the Pac-12 schools would be smart to ignore the temptation of greener grass in the Big 12. While money is always the biggest consideration in conference affiliation, it should not be the only one. He talks about how Arizona, Arizona State, and Colorado are lacking fan engagement, and he suggests the best way for them to do that is to win games and compete for championships And in 2024, in an expanded college football playoff, they'll get an automatic bid, is his point. And maybe that's true to some degree. Maybe Dan Wetzel is is right. Maybe he's on to something there with that commentary. But I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, okay, they could stay. They could make less money. Maybe once every 10 years, these teams might have a chance to get to a college football playoff. What's the best way for them to compete consistently near the top of any league over the next 15 years? Is it in the Pac-12 or is it in the Big 12? I know the answer, and you know the answer as well. He goes on to say, few programs have joined leagues outside their traditional footprint and found success. He goes, ask Boston College, ask Nebraska, ask West Virginia. Um, Okay, maybe, sort of. Nebraska's problem is it left the Big 12 and it lost the pipeline to Texas. West Virginia's problem has not been being in the Big 12. That's not been their problem. Ask any West Virginia fan. The Big 12 is not their problem. I get the travel's tough, but West Virginia really, what else were they going to do? The Big East was collapsing as we know it. Uh, They got an invite to a power conference and they took it. Would the ACC have been a better fit? Maybe. Am I sitting here telling you that Dana Holgerson or Neil Brown would have had more success if that team had been in the ACC the last 10 years? I don't think so. And by the way, you talk about teams not having success. How's Colorado done since it left the Big 12 for the Pac-12? I would argue the footprint for Colorado is better in the Big 12. Deion Sanders, um, you know, he can recruit anywhere, and name image likeness blows a lot of that traditional recruiting pipeline stuff up anyway. But Dion can go down the t- – you think Dion Sanders could recruit Texas out of the Big 12? I don't know. Anyone remember him? Dallas Cowboys? Hello. Uh, I know that many of you do. So that argument from Colorado's perspective, at least, for Dan Wetzel, uh, that doesn't fit. And I think the Arizona schools are culturally far better fits in the Big 12 than they are in the Pac-12. They are far more in common – I believe, with Oklahoma State and Texas Tech than they do Stanford and Cal. So how much money is Arizona and Arizona State and Colorado potentially willing to give up to stay in this, uh, what is ultimately going to be a slapstick league that is not going to have a lot of juice? All right, they'll have one team in a college football playoff starting in 2024. Great, maybe that's them once every 10 years. What's that worth? What's the point of that? So I know that so many of these national writers want to make this case, but I'm just telling you, I'm, I don't think it works. I don't. And, um, you know, we'll find out soon enough. There are rumblings on what the next Pac-12 meeting is going to ultimately look like, but we'll have to wait and see and, and uh, deal with how that plays out when it does. I'm Pete Mundo on Heartland College Sports. It is good to be here with you covering the Big 12 Conference. Let's talk some Big 12 basketball here. The season is over. It did not go as planned in March. Let's just be real here. If I told you to start March Madness that the Big 12 was going to find itself in a position 
with no team in the Final Four for the first time since 2017, what would you say? No way. We got seven teams in, a bunch of top seeds. Someone's going to get there, right? No. And not only did, did the Big 12 not get to a Final Four for the first time in six years, they had two teams in an Elite Eight. Both teams were favored going into the game. One of those teams was up, what, 12 points with 10 minutes left in Texas. Kansas State had a six-point lead with 10 minutes left. And both teams ended up losing and blew their games. I understand it's a one-and-done tournament. And you look at these one-and-done tournaments and you say to yourself, yeah, you know, you got to roll the dice sometimes. I get it. I get it. But we should be able to agree that this was a disappointing tournament for the Big 12 Conference. There's no doubt about it. By the way, if you're liking the videos, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. We appreciate you doing that. Share it on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. Hit that five-star rating and review on iTunes. Appreciate you guys doing that. Um, and you get a free Heartland College Sports koozie when you leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes and send me a screenshot to Pete Mundo, M-U-N-D-O, at heartlandcollegesports.com. So, uh, like, that's the Elite Eight storyline that is a total bust, right? And then if you go team by team, just for a second here, not to reopen wounds for some of you, but let's just do it. And I think you'll agree with me, and I'd be curious to hear from you on Facebook Live. Just leave a comment on if you think it is fair to say the Big 12 busted out in the NCAA tournament. Now, it was the only team with two teams in the Elite Eight out of the power conferences. The Big East did, but I don't consider the Big East a Power Five conference. It's just not, by definition. But Baylor lost in the second round to Creighton. Creighton's a good team. They were close to getting to the Final Four, but uh, Baylor didn't really hang in that game all that well. So that's Baylor. Then you go on down the line. Uh, Iowa State, ugly as it gets. Worst performance in the conference in the NCAA tournament. That was a hideous performance from Iowa State against Pittsburgh. From there, Kansas, no Bill Self, defending champs, knocked out before the Sweet 16 as a number one seed falling to Arkansas, an eight seed, in a game that they also blew uh, in the final 10 minutes of that game. K-State, six-point lead in the Elite Eight, trying to make their first Final Four since 1964 against Florida Atlantic. They're up six points with about 10 minutes left in the game. They have a chance to take a couple of larger leads. They really could have pushed that lead to 10 to 12 points at one point, and they missed some opportunities on that front. They end up losing that game, and the offense was ugly down the stretch. Uh, you look at TCU. As good as this TCU team was, uh, they win their first round game, and they end up also blowing a lead against Gonzaga, right? I mean, that's, that's what happened to TCU as well in the NCAA tournament. TCU was leading in that second half, leading at halftime, and they blew a lead to Gonzaga. And you go on down the line from there. Texas, blown lead. Right? And West Virginia. West Virginia as well. Let's not forget. It feels I know that West Virginia game feels like a million years ago, and it does to me as well. But can we not forget that the Mountaineers were dominating that game early on? Like the first 10 minutes of that game, they were down two at halftime. But don't forget that the Mountaineers, they were in complete control of that game. They were up early 19 to 8, and they end up losing to Maryland in the first round. Now, they had to take on Alabama after that anyway, and they probably would have lost the game. But still, the story for the Big 12 and the Big Dance is blown leads. It is what it is, and I understand, and I'm with you there, Jared, where you know they're going to be fine, they're going to come back strong next year, and they still perform better than the other Power 5 conferences. It was a tournament of complete and utter chaos. Don't get me wrong. Look at the Final Four. San Diego State, FAU, Miami, and UConn. If you had that, go buy yourself a lottery ticket tomorrow. Do yourself a solid. But when we talk about the Big 12, and we all agreed that this was the best conference in America, hands down, the Big 12 is great, nobody's better. And I'm with you there. But the league did not perform in March Madness like the best conference in America. That's just a fact. Especially with the depth that this league had, I still think this was the best conference in America, hands down. But with the depth that this league had, the reality is when it came to performing in March on the biggest stage, the stage that matters the most in college basketball, the stage that everybody pays the most attention to, this league did not perform like a lot of us thought it would. 
and that's uh that's a reality of the situation in terms of how March Madness went for the Big 12. But now it's hey, we got plenty of content on the website by the way. These shows are not ending. We've got plenty of YouTube, podcast, written content. Follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh we'll be pushing a lot of content. Hey, we got baseball, softball. We've been covering those in full swing. Off-season football is going to be, you know, obviously a hot topic for us here moving forward. And the basketball scene's not going anywhere. So be sure to check us out. I'm Pete Mundo on HeartlandCollegeSports.com. Thank you for being here and being a part of this video and this show. Subscribe before you leave. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. And um, help us grow this show every single day. We're doing it with you at the grassroots level. So thank you for that. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.